Your brain is truly amazing. Hey, it's the very reason that you're able to click on this video and to even doing things like blinking and breathing. In fact, scientists have often referred to the human brain as the most complex thing in the known universe, beating out all those galaxies and star systems because we just cannot really comprehend how this organ could do all these amazing things that it does. But it's not always been like this. Yes, it has actually been like this for around 2.6 million years, but even then, humans would think much differently, especially if we do take this back even further to our ancestors, where the brain would practically be unrecognisable, not having noticeable features we've evolved to have to this day. So let's go over a somewhat brief history of our most defining organ, unearthing when actually our most important evolutionary jumps took place defining when humans actually became humans, because it's truly remarkable. Here's the history of the entire brain, I guess. The earliest classification we have of some sort of brain system is roughly over 600 million years ago, what we call the Ediacaran period. This was so long ago that it was actually before the supercontinent Pangaea. During this time, the main animals that roamed the earth were Nidaria, simple multicellular organisms that include things like jellyfish. The main thing in common that we still have to this very day are the simple nervous systems our ancient ancestors of this time also shared. These nerve systems were by no means perfect, it was basically a diffuse network of nerve cells, but they did allow the ancestors to perform basic movements in response to environmental stimuli. And this is highly crucial because it paved the way for the following nerve systems to evolve in more recent ancestors, who we've still evolved from. Advanced the clock about 50 million years and evolution struck again. From Nidaria arose bilaterans, two with a complex internal network that you and me have inherited. These bilaterans may consist of creatures such as flatworms, starfish and even coral, with their key differences in their evolution consisting of a more centralised nerve cord and simple brain-like structures. You can see this in their segmentation. Contrast it to a jellyfish in which it's all a simple cluster, these bilaterans have specialised ganglia in different regions of their body. This allowed for greater movement and sensory processing. Obviously again, such parts that we use to this day. So as of now, we've gone from a simple network of nerves to a complex cluster for things like taxis and kinesis. And even then, we can still see evolutionary differences in the quote, brains of animals millions of years ago. If we advance though another 100 million years or so, we enter one of the most fascinating periods of history, the Cambrian period. The Cambrian explosion saw a rapid development of life, with the first vertebrates forming. Early fish species arose, and they began to exhibit distinct regions in their brains, which again we have now. The three main areas of the brain that evolved these millions of years ago include the forebrain, in which it was responsible for processing sensory information and initiates voluntary actions, the midbrain, of which has function in vision and motor control, and the hindbrain, which has a role in regulating basic life functions such as your breathing and your heart rate. This also consists of the cerebellum. These regions developing allowed our ancestors to interact with the environment to an even greater level, potentially showing complex behaviours. We start to expect predation and hunting with greater sensory processing, alongside schooling, herding and even mating rituals with the complex coordination. The pons and the medulla oblongata would also be found here, responsible for these early fish's connections to their spinal cord and thus movement. As humans, we also have all of these now. But even with all these evolutionary advancements taking place, from a simple nerve system to now different regions of the brain, we can still advance this a lot further. Both me and you obviously share more things in common now with these ancestors, but there's a lot more room to go as we start to see complex species such as reptiles and mammals form. Around 400 million years ago, the brain got another huge upgrade. Now, the current time period is the Devonian period, a part of the Paleozoic era, and the Earth kind of looked like this. The period saw a rise to many more complex fish species as seen from the Cambrian explosion, and it's generally thought that these fish species evolved to be the ones that would eventually settle on land. You're probably related to this guy. The key difference in the brain of the current species is that they have adapted the limbic system, one of the most crucial parts of the brain we use to this day. It's part of our brain involved in behavioural and emotional responses and consists of many organs itself, such as the basal ganglia, the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus and the cingulate gyrus. These have hugely important roles such as the hippocampus in memory formation, 
the amygdala in fear response, and the hypothalamus for regulating homeostasis, especially with our new lungs and better hearts. Fish would have needed this for combating prey and predation alike, whilst also as seen in stickleback fishes to this day, forming fixed action patterns in the hypothalamus. Hippocampal memories would have them avoid areas, project fear from threats, and even move to optimal waters. Now, the most common example of these fish are the Tiktaalik, of which are obviously now extinct. These fish represent the transition between non-tetrapod vertebrates and early tetrapods, our next closest common ancestor, quite typically known as Ichthyostega. Well, this is at least one of them. Now we've got limbs and a better set of lungs, and the ability to walk on land. You've probably seen this meme. All this occurred in the Carboniferous period, about 359 million years ago. The most important features though must be the fine changes in the reptile's brain, of which of course has been passed down. The new dorsal pallium, in which is an early cerebral cortex, came into fruition, in which has greater roles in sensory and spatial processing, alongside decision making, laying groundwork for more complex abilities, as well as the amygdala getting a bit of a finer tuning. This allowed the species of the time to navigate the latest new craze of land highly efficiently. But if we add another 100 million years, we'd see the first mammals starting to evolve, and the new adaptations are perhaps even crazier, and we can almost begin to see even bigger similarities to them then and us now. This is what the first mammal is supposed to have looked like, and it's called Meganicodon. Now, 250 million years ago, we were in the Mesozoic era. Dinosaurs were currently roaming, so our little mammal ancestors would have had to adapt accordingly. And in doing so, the neocortex came to be, allowing for higher order cognitive functions. It'd be expected basic planning could occur with this, perhaps giving some, albeit very minimal, reasoning skills. The hippocampus will have also taken more space in the brain, adapting spatial memory and navigation, possibly to avoid their predators even more. We'd eventually see examples of the parietal lobe, motor cortex and somatosensory cortex, responsible for processing sensory information, voluntary muscle movements and tactile information, to a finer degree than what we currently are in the timeline. But we're still very, very far off the modern brain, despite lots of it now kind of currently existing. We're getting awfully close to the modern human brain coming into existence, but there's still a few crucial steps that occurred beforehand. Only 66 million years ago did the first primates come into existence. And because we're getting ever more closer to our precise taxonomical rank, the likeliness is getting similar. For example, during this time period, it's expected that these ancient primate ancestors would have begun getting an enlarged prefrontal cortex. The era is now the Cenozoic era, and it's the current era that we're actually in now. It's the age of mammals and birds and conifers. A lot of these early mammals, especially with Pangaea now breaking, would have had somewhat of a similar time early humans would have had. There was early ancestors of elephants, early rhinos, and even early giraffes. Not the real thing, but early ancestors. So, our own ancestors would have used their new prefrontal cortex capabilities to perform higher cognitive functions. Social behaviour would have been expected here too, leading to the formations of groups navigated through complex interactions within the species. The cerebellar neocortex would have also evolved, further developing the motor control and coordination. Examples of these could be early chimps being able to swing precisely from tree to tree, whilst also we're seen in modern chimps being able to use tools. We'd also see the corpus callosum form, finally connecting both the hemispheres of the head, and in these hemispheres, we'd start to see the modern lobes become more of a thing. Whilst, for example, the occipital lobe would have existed in some form a little before this, here is when it began getting finely tuned for your vision. These conditions obviously allow the species prosperity, leading it to pass on their genes until that critical mutation occurs, forming the new species. And this will have happened routinely until we pretty much to get where we are now. Us. Me and you modern humans as a whole. So, what's different? Well, again, the prefrontal cortex would have gotten even bigger. It's the reason why human babies are effectively useless. Because our head becomes so big over time with our increased brain power that it would be impossible to birth. I mean, you can do many things that our ancestors couldn't with this enlarged prefrontal cortex. We can reason, modus ponens and modus tollens. We can solve complex problems not seen in any other species, and we can suffer from crippling anxiety. And it doesn't end there. We developed only recently our specialised areas for language, both Broca's and Wernicke's area, for speech production and comprehension, whilst also getting regions such as the fusiform gyrus becoming highly specialised so we can recognise one another and see faces. Mirror neurons would arise to a fine degree, allowing us to copy actions within the premotor cortex, as well as the angular gyrus and anterior cingulate cortex giving us the power to read, perform maths and empathise with our fellow humans. 
Your brain is a wonderful thing and it's done so much to get you just where you are today. What started off as a couple of nerves has taken hundreds of million years to make you, you. And that's something really amazing. So which part of the brain are you most thankful for having? Let me know down below. And if you don't, well, you know better than a tick to lick. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate every single one of you. Be sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It's free and it really helps me out. See you next time.